heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them, from the larger-than-life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen to the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. The doctor saving lives at your local hospital. The war veteran down the street who risked his lives for our freedom. The police officers and firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur. The creator. The producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. And I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks of the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Oh, and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name's uh, Richard Matthews, and I'm live on the line today with Elise Koenig. Elise, are you there? I'm here. Hi. Awesome. So glad to have you here, Elise. I'll do a quick introduction for our listeners who have not heard of you before. Um, you are a beauty and wellness industry veteran who's worked cross-functionally on skincare, hair care, cos um, color cosmetics, men's grooming, fitness studios, and more, both in mass marketing and prestige verticals, and you help brands grow and succeed in crowded marketplace. Um, so um, if I'm understanding correctly, what you guys do is you actually help people with physical brands sell more, um, either online or in retail? Exactly. Well, there is the sales component. Right now, one of the big components is public relations. So if you're reading your favorite blog, if you're looking at your favorite magazine, that's where you hopefully would be seeing my clients. So it's all about those relationships with editors. And instead of paying for advertising, um, you would pay a retainer to a publicist who would then get you in multiple places instead of one. That's sort of the PR versus advertising 101. That makes a lot of sense. So mm -hmm. Tell me what it is that you are known for now. What's your business like? What kind of clients do you sort of attract? And what's the, uh, what's the thing that sort of stands out as the, the primary like service you offer to the, uh, to the world? So I am a PR and sales consultant, but I go across the board in the beauty space. I've been doing this for over 13 years now. I started a big agencies. I've worked in house. So I started my own company a little over three years ago. Um, and it, didn't set out to be this way, but I started working with female founded niche indie brands. That's just who I gravitated towards. And that's who um, I was successful at promoting. It's also, I'm based in Los Angeles and the indie beauty scene is really thriving right now, um, especially in skincare. And so things just were sort of fortuitous when I moved from New York City out to LA. That's where the boom started coming. People are looking to California for inspiration for beauty products. Um, but it has been a little over three years, so things are growing. Um, I now work, I just signed last week, a big men's brand. So obviously not an indie female founded brand. So um, I'm seeing where it takes me. That's really cool. So what sort of started you on this path to become an entrepreneur? We talk on this show all the time about your origin story, right? Mm -hmm. Every hero has their origin story. It's where you started to realize that, you know, maybe you were different, that maybe you did have superpowers and you could use them to help other people. Mm -hmm. So what sort of started that journey to become an entrepreneur for you? So I will say that when I first left my full-time job in early 2016, I actually did not have the goal of starting my own uh, PR business. I really just needed to take a break from working for the man. You know, uh, PR, even though it sounds like a sexy industry, it's also incredibly stressful. And I had been doing it since two weeks after college graduation. I moved to New York City. My first job was the Devil Wears Prada. Literally, I mean, I had umbrellas thrown at me at Fashion Week. So I was kind of raised. That, huh? That's one of my wife and I's favorite movies. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, it's very real. It was very realistic. I think a lot of people in my industry um, had a little bit of PTSD while watching that. But I also really, I chose beauty after that job because the beauty industry is so lovely. People are so open. I love how it's become very inclusive. Um, so sidetrack, but I was working at these big agencies in New York. I moved out to LA. That felt like enough for a while. But then it started becoming routine again. Um, and so I just said, I'm going to take a break. I went to New Zealand and Australia for a month. 
um, came back, sort of toying with what I really wanted and um, went to get my eyebrows microbladed, which as a man, you might not know what this is. I don't even know what that stands it's for. Uh, it's almost like a tattoo, It's but it's not blades. It's like a few little needles to fill in um, your eyebrows. It's semi-permanent. And we started talking about my career and the woman said, I'd, I'd love to work with you. And so that was the kickstart of me freelancing. And I'm lucky that I have wonderful relationships in the beauty industry. So people started sending business my way and here we are. Here you are three years later with a successful PR agency in the, in the yeah. cool. So, so it was actually a, a catalyst of, you know, just meeting someone who you were chatting with. That yeah. You know, I thought about it because when I first moved to LA, I actually was freelance for about six months. Um, but then I got an incredible opportunity to be the first ever in-house PR director for Too Faced Cosmetics. And I traveled globally for them. I went to Singapore, Malaysia, London, Paris. It was an incredible uh, job. Unfortunately, I had just moved to Hollywood and they were down in Irvine. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Los Angeles. Everyone knows the traffic. Yeah. It was about a three hour commute, depending. Um, I preferred traveling to Singapore those days than just driving in the traffic. I've, so, I've across LA where it takes uh, longer to go from Santa Monica to like the 15 freeway than it would to go from Marietta to Las Vegas. Oh yeah, it's, it's insane. Um, right now I love the fact that I work from home and whenever I have to go out for like a 5 p.m. appointment, I think how do people do this every day? <laughs> I think my favorite thing about being an entrepreneur honestly is working in my jammies at my pace. Um, I do really well with emails in the morning, but I'm more creative at night. So if you're sitting in an office from nine to seven, because that's pretty much the PR hours, then you have events afterwards. I feel like I wasn't utilizing um, my brain the best way. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the things I love too. My my wife and I have homeschooled our kids for, you know, going on 10 years now. And I've been a, a stay-at-home dad, like entrepreneur for 10 mm -hmm. years. And like when we go out places like, and it's busy, I'm always like, oh, what's going on? Like, why do I have to stand in a line? You realize, oh, it's a holiday or, oh, it's like we went on a, on a weekend and didn't know it. Cause like, you know, if you work all the time, you know, right. Oh, it blends. Absolutely. Like, all blend together, like <laughs> Monday and Saturday are like the same thing. So it doesn't make I any sense. I understand that. Yeah. I know. But so it, it ended up, I had considered it already, but I also feel very strongly and everyone has their own path, but I think I was too young to have created what I've created now when I first started freelancing before that two-faced job. I think had I not gone in-house and had that experience, and then my last full-time job, I was the VP of beauty and wellness bringing in all of the business for a fashion agency. I was developing that business for them. So it really taught me how to close the deal. I, I come from a family of salespeople, but it really um, let me develop that muscle and the clients were coming for me. And so I thought, why am I taking a commission on this? Why don't I just do it myself? But it took me a while to get there. And I think it just takes one person saying something. Because um, I hate when I listen to stuff and I think, oh, well, you just were at the right place at the right time. I'm always about like things being accessible to everyone. And I do have that person not said, let's work together. Who knows? Maybe I would have gone back for a full-time job. But I always love stories where it's like oh, okay I, I could make that happen for myself too it's not just luck yeah yeah I know uh for myself I had a similar um similar experience I had started freelancing um in uh right after college and uh did that for several years and was okay at it um and when I say okay at it I was getting great results for my clients but I wasn't like charging what I was worth because I didn't mm -hmm. do it myself mm -hmm. um, so I was struggling um, cause I didn't, you know, I wasn't making enough money to like, you know, feed myself and like pay for marketing and like deliver a good experience, that kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, things you, you learn later in life, um, and s shut all that down to take a, uh, a marketing director position and the marketing director position, I was there for 18 months and, um, you know, got to be in charge of, you know, humongous budgets and, you know, we 10 X their lead flow. You really get a solid handle on like what your skill sets are. Right. Uh, and like the confidence to back them up and was able to take that into our, you know, freelance career afterwards. Right. Uh, and really. Absolutely. 
And I try to tell people, um, I do miss mentoring. I am starting to grow my business to where I will have that opportunity again. Um, but what I loved about agency life and being actually in a company was helping the younger girls in the PR world grow. Cause it can be very cutthroat, especially in New York, when you're getting started, you're making $4 and you have eight roommates and you're trying to just figure it out. Um, but I, a lot of those girls would come to me even years later and a lot of them are thinking about going freelance. I always advise waiting until you have at least enough experience across the board. Um, but some of them I think are braver than I probably was at their age. And the, the world's changing. The way we work now is yeah, changing. It's it faster and moves quicker. Yeah. Than it did, mm -hmm. uh, even just a, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and it's, it's interesting too, because like I just got to the point in my business where, where I started to hire staff and bring people on and I'm really enjoying that, that aspect mm -hmm. of growing my business as well. Um, so it's, know. I've had a virtual assistant for a while and that actually took being part of a business coaching program for her to say, what are you doing? Like you, you're making enough and you will allow yourself to grow if you just have someone come in. So now they handle, you know, my bread and butter is my editorial lists. So my connections, my relationships, yes, but if my lists aren't organized into what beat people cover. Are they working on long lead, which is a magazine timeline? Are they working on short lead, which is newspaper or TV? If those aren't organized, I'm doomed. So having someone else take that over for me was very scary, but it has been significantly more helpful because now I'm not working on the minutia. I'm actually working on client relations or pitching and getting coverage for my clients. Um, so I do have now subcontractors working on a few brands, but that's an interesting shift too in how I tell clients because my, before my pitch is you're working with me, you're working with a senior level publicist, I'm doing it all. And now it's not that anymore, but I also don't want to try to compete against the huge agencies that I used to work at. So it's really finding that niche and just yeah. continuing to grow. But right. find, I don't want to grow. I'm not like, yay, scale everything, hire all the people. I want to do what's best for me. And I've enjoyed the entrepreneur life. And I don't want to go back into an office. I don't want to make these girls come into an office every day. So it's, it's playing with it. Yeah. Yeah. I sort of got a, um, we, we talk, talk regularly on the show about, you know, build, knowing the monster you're building. Mm hmm. Is like you could, if you wanted to, you could probably build a seven figure agency with a hundred, you know, hundred employees and stuff like that. But you may not want that, right? You have got you gotta you gotta know what it is you want to build. And that's been hard for me because I've always been very ambitious. I've always, okay, I have this goal, I'm gonna get it. But that goal was also typically the next pay raise, the next title, because I was used to working in corporate America. So now it's how do I keep myself satisfied and how do I feel like I do have stretch goals that I'm going after. But that it's okay to maybe not want those things. And that has been something that I continually have to reevaluate. You know, what feels like success for me? Is it just a number? Is it right now I'm working with clients that I like every single person. When I get an email or when I get a phone call, I do not feel like, <gasps> and trust me, I have worked with those people even on my own. I thought I'd only pick nice people and that would be the beauty of working for yourself. But no, I've, I've worked with some real gems. <laughs> so it's, um, that's something that I view as success. So it's sort of picking different pieces than what I thought I would have in a corporate career. Yeah, I know how that goes. Cause like, I, I remember pretty specifically, actually, I, like my goals were like, I had revenue goals and I was going to hit these revenue goals. And, you know, I had like where I wanted to be and where I was going to be. And then like these big stretch goals. And then like, I, I hit a number and I realized I was like, I don't care anymore. Like, yeah. I can do what I want to do. The revenue goal is not exciting. Yeah. Uh, and so it wasn't worth pursuing and growing for. Um, and started realizing like I needed to have other things that were driving me. So for me, it's been um, uh, family experiences, right? That's why we travel. Um, and so, you know, you know, like, you know, how much is it going to cost to be able to buy an RV and have employees and do the things I need to do so I can travel with my kids and go eat at cool restaurants. And my kids are at the St. Louis Science Center right now. They're spending the day there having fun. Like, like God, I would have loved to have been your kid. It sounds like you guys are doing the coolest stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's super, it's super fun. But I realized it was like, it was, it was not revenue things that were driving me. 
right? right? It was, it was uh, experiences that I wanted to have, right? Um, and so that has been helping me grow my business um, mm -hmm. and sort of like knowing, okay, what is it going to take to hit, you know, to do this thing or do the other thing? And like my wife and I are talking right now, when we're done traveling the U.S., we're talking about how can we do some international travel and like, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe uh, rent an Airbnb in London or in Buenos Aires and stay for a month or two and, you know, um, and sort of travel that way. I've heard a lot of people doing that, freelancers and entrepreneurs, where instead of just going for a week and fully taking time off and going, just having like your week vacation, like you would if you had a corporate job, people do go for a longer time because you can still work there. Um, uh, you can just there's a writer. Work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a writer who did remote year um, and she really inspired me because it was a different city um every month around the world and she's a freelance writer so she was still having to hit deadlines yeah. i looked into it but i actually have um i have this is so silly but i have a diabetic dog it's actually not silly it's really hard um but i love him very much he's been in my life he's a little rescue for six years he's had diabetes for two years so i have to give him an insulin shot every morning and every night and I travel for business, so luckily I found some wonderful sitters who are willing to stay at my house and help, but I can't leave for a month the way I did for New Zealand and Australia. I still have that dream of trying that again, but I've also realized that he's my baby for right now, and I'm going to be okay. there and you know stick that out while he's still happy and energetic. And in a way, I think it's helped me probably grow my business because I am home. I am focused. Um, he actually came to my last two full-time jobs with me because LA is very dog friendly. Yeah. But part of me thinks if I was working constantly, he might not be here because it, it took a lot to get him stable and to get him healthy. So I like what you're talking about being able to earn money for certain goals. That's where I am grateful that I've been able to shape my life um, and still be quote unquote successful, at least financially. We just adopted a cat last week. You may or may not see him walk behind me here on our, oh, our wow. we have a, we have a, a big fat orange cat that uh, was, was left at one of the RV resorts um, and was freezing outside. So we, uh, the, the, the owner there was like trying to find a place for him and we were like, Hey, we'll take him. So oh, thank you for rescuing him. That's so yeah. awesome. And then we have a poodle which I don't know where he is. He's usually, he's usually sitting at my lap, you know, sitting here at the desk, you know. Do they get along? Uh, they do. They get along. Right. So the first couple of, first couple of, my dog it can be very intense. Like yeah. he's, he's like, he gets so excited. He shakes like just me. Uh, <laughs> so like we brought the cat in and he's just like, oh, I, like my new what friend. Is you know, yeah. my favorite. So anyways, it took him about a week to get to the point where, you know, they could like hang out. My dog wasn't like, I don't know, intensing all over him. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. How cool. You really can pick up and go all around the place, even with dogs. Funnily enough, a lot of the people, there's a diabetic dog group with 6,000 people in it on Facebook. Okay. These Facebook groups are incredible. Beauty has really huge ones too. PR has huge ones that have really helped me with leads because it's PR shared with journalists. So the Facebook groups have been a huge resource for me in various areas of my life. But um, a lot of these people, because they don't trust leaving their dog with somebody else because the insulin shots are such a big deal. You could absolutely kill him if you give him too much. They travel in RVs. That's been a thing that I've been seeing a lot more pictures. It sounds really fun. Yeah, it is super fun. So I want to move on in the interview a little bit and ask you about your superpowers, right? So the way I've been framing this lately has been talking a little bit about what, you know, what is it that you do or build or office world that helps solve problems for people? But like when you think through your skill sets and the things that you might say, hey, you know, these are my superpowers, what's the one that you sort of think energizes the rest of your skills, right? The one that you can sort of see the thread going through and be like, that's the one thing I have that I'm really, really good at that really empowers me to do all the things I do for people. I really care. Um, sometimes that's my downfall because it gives me anxiety when things aren't working well, but I truly care about my clients. I care about their success, especially working with small brands. I mean, these people are bootstrapping. So if I screw up, that's their money. Um, and I just always really cared about maintaining relationships. Loyalty is super important to me. Um, so I think that that has served me well because maintaining editorial relationships, keeping your clients happy. Um, and I, I'm able to be 
don't know how to say this without actually sounding like a jerk, but I'm fairly likable. I'm able to talk about a lot of different things. I think when I go out and I meet someone, I'm able to make them feel comfortable and find something that they feel connected to. Um, I will attribute that to my my parents and my grandparents. They've I have a mom who's very like nurturing and my friends always used to want to come to my house to you know talk to her and then my dad who is very logical but also great at sales and just such a sweet guy and so I think I was able to pick up on all of that yeah I I like we call that empathy right um, yeah well there you go yeah, yeah. Um, the the empathy superpower is not as common as I think it should be um, my uh, my best friend um, and business partner on a few things has that same like power and it's interesting to see how it energizes so many other skills my wife is like that too where you you if you look at a lot of the things you do you realize the reason you're learning them or the reason you get good at them is because mm-hmm. it really helps show other people how much you care about them mm-hmm. uh, and and it's a it's a great driver for business because people are going to do business with someone they know like and trust and it's something that you can build automatically where those of us who struggle more with empathy um, have to work harder <laughs> to to get to the same point in a relationship. It is funny because my sister actually took a test. I've wanted to take this, but I think you have to be a larger corporation or there, there's something. It's not just your, you know, Myers Briggs. There's different versions of this test. And her number one quality that came up was empathy. And she was telling me some of the questions. And I was like, oh, yeah, we're the same in that. Yeah. Um, but it, it served me well. It's also, I, they call it being spongy, where sometimes if you're, if you're too open, you absorb other people's stuff. So it's finding that balance, especially of, you know, that work-life balance and not taking on too much of other people's stuff. Right. It's really hard to say no yeah. to people who are toxic yeah. um, and clients who are toxic. And like, there's some, there's definitely some pitfalls to, to that superpower because you can, um, you can very easily put someone else's needs in front of your own. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that starts making it so you can't meet either your needs or any of your clients' needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That sponginess is my kryptonite, but I, I, I am proud of that though. I um, appreciate the fact that, I'm able to connect with other people because I think it's led to some really rich uh, relationships with people who maybe I wouldn't have necessarily met or been drawn to. So it's been cool. Uh, yeah. So we, we actually, we talk a little bit about that on the, the show too, is your fatal flaw, right? So just like Superman has his kryptonite, mm-hmm. uh, the fatal flaw is something that you struggle with in your business that, you know, you've had to work on in order to, to grow and change and like how, you know, so it, you just mentioned, you know, the sponginess, how, how have you, been working on that so it doesn't become a detriment to your business for other people who might suffer from the same thing? I actually just, well, I will credit my um, now ex-boyfriend, but I will credit him for helping me to sort of um, balls up, if you will, and just go for it. And to when people are being toxic or pushing back, um, there was one time he was actually at my house and saw a Slack conversation and was like, absolutely not no, like stand up for yourself here. And I think that's helped me learn when it's okay. I think there's a lot of times when you have a a feminine energy, um, you can learn a lot from male entrepreneurs. And I hate when people, you know, women can do it all. Yes, but we're trained, we're raised to be a certain way. It hasn't shifted yet. I don't think it sounds like you're raising your daughters to be very well-rounded and independent women. So kudos, but I don't think everyone's like that now. We're raised to please people. So I've been learning, you know, I learned about that. And I also um, just signed up for Denise, I must say her last name wrong, Duffield Thomas. She has a thing called the Money Mindset Boot Camp. And I've thought about doing this for years. Uh, just like I signed up for Marie Forleo's B School right after I quit my full time job. But it was running while I was in Australia and I didn't want to deal with it. But I'm starting to really invest in myself, um, but this money boot camp has been very interesting. It's dealing with your money blocks, and that's where I got the term "spongy" from. Is I realized how I take other people's things on, and I'm even trying to help some of these younger girls who are freelancing, like charge what you're worth. Just what you were saying that um, I felt connected to that when you're saying you couldn't even pay your own bills, but you're getting great results for your clients. It's scary for a lot of people, but I have gradually been upping my retainers. I know I over deliver for my clients. And so I, I deserve to be paid for that. 
yeah, that's a, and it's a, it's a cool place to be in your business when you sort of start to realize that you, you are worth more than you're charging. And mm -hmm. then like, I, I'll remember forever the first time I asked a client for a retainer that was significantly higher than I was used to charging. And they just immediately said, yes, mm -hmm. like all of my fears were like, oh, um, so and they were like one of the best clients I ever worked with and we're still friends today and that kind of thing. Well, uh, that's also the interesting piece that I have found. I think this is the same across because I've been in you know, freelance groups or other business groups where the people who can pay the least and who want all the discounts are also the hardest to handle clients. It's the yeah. people who know that they're investing in something worthwhile and they're like, okay, here, here you go they're typically the ones that are easiest and, and they probably get the best results because I'm, I'm happy working with them. Yeah. Yeah. And you realize that the, uh, the people that are, um, who are capable of paying generally understand what they're paying for. Yes. Right? I'm paying for your expertise because I don't want to be an expert in that space. I don't want to know what you do or how you do it. I just want it to be done. Mm -hmm. So we can move on with our business and do the things that I'm good at. Right. Um, and so you end up with, they're just better relationships all around. Like, uh, and, um, and it's not necessarily the, the price points. And a lot of times it's, it's the understanding of the entrepreneur and like, that comes along with higher prices generally because you're working with higher level businesses. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really nice. So um, my next question for you has to do with uh, your common enemy. This is something that you fight against all the time with your clients um, where like, think of it like this. If you could, every client that you hire, if, if you could just like wave your magic wand and remove something that you struggle with them understanding or getting or something like that, that you know that if they could just change their mindsets or change their habits in this area, that you could get them results better, cheaper, faster, you know, for whatever it is that you do. What's, what's the thing that you sort of run up against all the time? Well, luckily, because I have been raising my retainers and working with some slightly different businesses, this problem has started to fade, but it is the trust. Um, people where it's, you know, they're bootstrapping or it's a really marketing and PR is one of the bigger investments you're going to make, um, especially in the beauty space. It's so crowded. It's knowing that things aren't going to come immediately. Um, it's especially right now. I mean, back in the day they did, I've had to adjust too. my expectations are super high. I've been very disappointed sometimes in myself of you should be getting more placements right away. Luckily I have an amazing group of people who do what I do and we're all very supportive instead of competitive. And I realize it's just the industry is shifting. Um, so it's all of us are having to learn how to trust the way it's moving and that it's still going to work for all of us. Yeah, and I would imagine for, for your, in, in the beauty space, the beauty space is becoming a lot more accessible because mm -hmm. of technology, right? It's, it's easier to build products and get products going and stuff like that. I know because um, we, have, we have a supplement line. Um, and so, I mean, it's not the same as beauty space, but I know, you know, 10 years ago, you had to have huge, massive investments and buy lots of inventory and do all this stuff. And you had to, mm -hmm. you had to be a big business to start a business, mm -hmm. right? Um, or had big money for it. And nowadays you can get started in a space with, you know, small, low inventory numbers and just build a brand and start to sort of grow with the, grow with your, uh, your audience. Well, especially now too, with just social media websites, all the different things we can do. If you just have a D to C site, you can build it yourself if you have the right strategy behind it. Um, but supplements actually are really having a big moment in the beauty industry too. And years ago, editors wouldn't talk about it because it wasn't, you know, regulated in the way that certain beauty things were. But now there's a lot of brands who, you know, internally you can help your skin, et cetera. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So um, if, so trust is the common enemy that you have to fight in your cities. It's getting a lot better just because, because of uh, what you're changing with your clients. They sort of understand better. The other yeah. side of that, is what you fight for, right? So you're driving force, just like Spider-Man fights to save New York or Batman fights to save Gotham or Google fights mm -hmm. to index and categorize all the world's information. What is it that you fight for in your business? Your I fight for most of my brands have a charitable or some sort of beautiful story behind it or something that they care about. That's something where I'm only taking on brands now who are either willing to open that up um, and have that as part of their business. And that's where the female founded 
uh, niche was really great for a while too, is I feel like I was fighting for these women because if you look at, you know, VC money, it's what, like 3% or something ridiculous, even in beauty. I mean, you would think that beauty women are the people who buy it the most, but it's all men. It's all men at the top of the food chain. And that enrages me. It really does. Cause I feel like I see these women working so hard and we don't get paid as much. Our opinions, it's like, oh, have your have your wife try this and get back to me versus having like a female executive. So I feel very passionately about that. Um, but now that I'm opening my business and working with some bigger brands where it's not like, okay, I'm getting this one woman on TV, like I'm gonna make her famous. Um, that has been shifting. And so I, I want to make sure that they are aligned with my uh, values, very eco-friendly brands. Um, I have one right now who has an aluminum bottle and refill pouches. Uh, Sustainability is really important. It's um, getting a lot of attention, but it's also made my job harder. Now the mailers we used to send out to editors with crinkle and cute gifts, people are really pushing back on that. So now it's finding a way to still get clients' attention while being good to the environment too. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I know one of the things that uh, we did with our uh, our supplement brand um, was we started uh, we started a program called Buy a Bottle, Save a Life, mm. uh, and the because uh, um, we we sell vitamins and minerals, and um, one of the leading causes of death in children um, around the world is uh, vitamin A deficiency. Um, mm. And so there's a, a an organization called Vitamin Angels that offers. Um, they basically it costs about a quarter to give a child enough vitamin a for a year that they don't die from diseases right? oh wow I mean, that sounds like something so simple that no one should be dying from that yeah absolutely and mm-hmm. so what we do is we uh we donate a quarter um of every every sale we have um so every bottle we sell um we donate to that so it's you know because it, it basically it, it it literally saves a child's life yeah. that's um, incredible yeah, that's, and that's so like important that. Yeah, it's, I mean, but having that almost like nowadays, if you're a brand and you don't have something like that, it's, you're yeah. going to be frowned upon. It's, it's interesting because we did it because it fit with our brand story mm-hmm. uh, and like what we were trying to do. And right, so like our, our brand story is like eliminating that nutritional gap between like the, our, the food that you eat versus what you should actually be getting in. Our food is not nearly as nutritious as it was 100 years ago because right. of farming and practice and stuff like that. So it's like if we're trying to eliminate that gap here, how can we also, you know, it, it fit with our brand story, but the uh, um, the interesting thing that happened is once we started the program, our sales went up, right? We started selling more. Consumers uh, are quote unquote more woke, you know, as they yeah. say, people are supporting with their dollars the, the trends and the things that they want to happen in the world. Um, and so that's why it is so important for my clients. But so one of my brands is a skincare brand and they source a lot of their ingredients from the Caribbean. It's a lot of uh, Caribbean botanicals and actives. So they give back to hurricane relief every year, like a significant portion. And the way we thank editors for coverage is donating in their name. And people have really responded to that because typically we would send a bouquet of flowers that had a Caribbean theme or like some Caribbean candy or, and sometimes that fits, but typically that's enough of a thank you. Um, because they want to be doing good. People want to give back where they can. Uh-huh. And it's cool too, because when you sort of understand that about the, uh, the, the way the consumer space is moving, you realize that people want to buy products that they can tell a good story about. Mm-hmm. Right? The, the reason why people like Tesla or the reason why people buy things, you know, like, because I don't know if you know those little bracelets that are selling everywhere now that when you buy a bracelet, they, you know, they clean up trash from the ocean or something like that. Um, yeah, I think it's like the Tom's model too at the beginning, you know, like the yeah. buy one, give a pair of shoes to a kid. Yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's part of the story. Like you you get to you get to tell a good story when you buy a product, and it helps mm-hmm. the uh, you know people buy for emotional reasons, and they justify later logically. Um, and so it it just fits right in with buying psychology, right? You're you're helping them have both an emotional connection at the beginning and it's a really good logical backup later when they're thinking about why did I buy this? I'd well, like when it. you share, I've found that people are like, oh, what's that shirt? And if you share something and there is an interesting story, it connects you to that person. It makes you feel proud about what you've done to, there's some sort of other reward. But I always say, uh, I mean, sometimes look, it's, it's beauty PR. I'm working on beauty products, sometimes it can be a little um, superficial. And so I've tried to find 
the pieces that make me feel proud. I am saving the world one lipstick at a time. But, you know, I used to work on a really large mass brand. Um, and they have a gigantic charitable initiative that has continued to grow. And it gives back to women and all these celebrities go. And now it's become a huge thing that people are starting to pay attention to um, these causes. And so that's been really important to me is just finding something where I don't feel like I'm just trying to, to hawk a lipstick to someone to be like, you need to look prettier. It's about feeling good inside too. Yeah. Yeah. I think Dove has done a really good job with that branding yeah. mm -hmm. uh, for the last 10 years or so. They've been really, really hitting that, that messaging hard that it's, you know, it's, it's making your body something you're comfortable being in and you know, mm -hmm. that you're so totally. Um, and I could see, like, I could see how that'd be tough in the beauty space too, right? Because, because it on the surface, it's definitely a a uh, it seems superficial. Yeah. Uh, but there's more to it than that, right? There's there more is to more it. to it, and it's also I've chosen certain spaces and brands that don't feel so much like that. You have to know who you are, and I'm not. I don't wear a ton of makeup. You know, I have my five minute face but I love a great mascara. It can totally make you feel better about yourself. I walk around LA with nothing on, my hair in a greasy ponytail and you know sweats. Luckily, athleisure is very cool here. <laughs> but I still, you know, when I put on a little something, I do feel better about myself. And so I try to think about that. It's not just external. It's I think I walk with my head held high, even just washing my hair and not having the top knot bun, you know, for this, podcast since we're also recording on video I was like you know what I'm going to make sure that I I feel my best and then you speak more confidently yeah and it's uh it's the same thing goes true on the uh the male side too right making sure you like there's one of the brands that I follow I can't remember his name off the top of my head but he teaches men how to dress mm -hmm. and like you know it, it seems like it's a it's a beauty thing but really it, it helps them be more confident, helps them oh, get absolutely. better paying jobs and do better things for their community, right? And you know, when you when you learn to be your best self, you can step up and be your best self in the community and actually make an impact. Exactly. And you know, while I'm still gonna go to the grocery store, probably looking like a hot mess and still feel just as confident, because I do think that you should, you know, always have that inner confidence, there is something about I'm not gonna go to a meeting looking like that. You know, it's just different. Yeah, I know how that goes. Occasionally, however, if you're doing like what we do and we're traveling, you end up in a repair shop and there's like, there's no showers around. So you're like, oh, my hair's too greasy for the show. <laughs> That's all right. I hope I'll be forgiven. It just looks beautifully shiny. There you go. Very healthy and shiny. <laughs> healthy and shiny. Um, so that's the, yeah, that's the way it goes. Um, the... So my next, my next question for you is more practical based, right? So we call this the uh, hero's tool belt, right? Maybe you got a big magical hammer like Thor or a bulletproof vest like your neighborhood police officer. What are some of the tools you use on a daily basis, you know, um, that really help energize your business um, that you just, you couldn't do without today? I could not do without friends in the same industry. Um, these people are, it, it is so wonderful to not, compete and to support. I know I mentioned that earlier, but I think it's still a thing. Everyone's like, oh, we might be going after the same client. I've gone after the same client with friends. They've won some, I've won some. And I'll even say like, how can I help you with that behind the scenes? There are some media databases that publicists pay into to use. Um, and one of my girlfriends, they haven't paid into it this year. And she said, hey, can you get me these names, these editorial contacts? And yeah, it took me a few minutes yesterday when I didn't have time, but I did it because she's given back to me so much too. So it's um, utilizing those relationships. And then also the toolkit is those databases. The Facebook groups have been really incredible, like I mentioned before. Um, those are, that's sort of the bread and butter, but then it's also just keeping up with people. I mean, PR is all about keeping up with editors, pitching, being a good writer, always trying to refresh, paying attention to seasonal trends, um, creativity. It's really, really interesting that you, uh, you talk about the, uh, the community aspect for entrepreneurship. And it's one of the things that I know people struggle with. They struggle with the idea that uh, competition is bad. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it, on one hand, it can be, Right, it can be difficult for your business to deal with, you know, tough competitive competition. But at the same point, the other the other side of that coin is like we're 
we're not fighting over a limited pie. We're making the pie bigger. Right. right. You're, you're adding adding to the world. Exactly. There's enough for everybody, especially, I mean, not always. So look, if there's like a massive recession and all of these indie beauty brands go under, ask me then. But I do feel like there's there's enough for everybody. And um, we've even, you know, sharing business and saying who wants to work on what. That's the other thing is whose skill set. You know, like I'm, I'm good at certain things that other people really aren't. And so it's finding how you play off that when you're by yourself um, and not just having to hire them, you know, just being able to brainstorm with people um, is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And I know um, one of the things that uh, I've talked about a lot with, with people, you know, my own clients and other people that I've worked with is, uh, is realizing the whole idea that like, if someone doesn't like you or doesn't mesh well, or doesn't, you know, like they're not your client, right? Like it doesn't, Mm -hmm. not everyone has to be your client for you to have a successful business. Right. and I know that's something like my, uh, my wife struggled with when she was doing cake decorating professionally a few years ago. She was like, she was like, yeah, but not everyone likes my style, right? Cause she does pointillism, um, style designs on the cakes and they're really cool. cool. And she's like, some people really want the, uh, the fondant. And I was like, that's not really a problem. Like those people just aren't your clients. Right. And you can find, I, it is scary when you're first starting out. I mean, I certainly took on some things. Luckily, I, I do feel like I've been pretty discerning in knowing what's not right for me. Things have shifted. Some people I thought were really right for me, and they are for a time period. That's been a harder lesson for me to learn, too, is how to say goodbye if yeah. something is not working for you, um, especially when you put so much into it. That can be really scary, um, thinking, am I ever going to get this again? And I have found that once I let go of something that was no longer serving me, my business in the last eight months really grew and I call it the customer avatar. I mean, everyone calls it that, but I really tried to make a list of who my ideal customer avatar was. And, um, it's not always perfect. Not everyone I'm signing fits all of those pieces, but it's definitely getting closer as I try to listen to myself more. I've certainly been on calls where I'm like, Oh yeah, no, that's, yeah, no, you're not for me. I've, I've had that a couple of times you get on the call and you're like, they're like, can I work with you? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm fresh out of space. I have some recommendations for you. Though. Right, right. Absolutely. <laughs> Learning to say no. So I'm going to talk a little about your own personal heroes, right? Just like Frodo had Gandalf or Luke had Obi-Wan or Robert Kiyosaki had his rich dad. Who were some of your heroes? Were they real life mentors? Were they speakers or authors, peers who were a couple of years ahead of you? Um, and how important were they to what you've accomplished so far in your career? So I have a a variety. I would say that my uh, grandfather, I feel bad calling one out because they've all been very influential, but my grandfather's now 93. He worked at uh, Bell South, which I don't even think exists anymore. Maybe it became Southern Bell from North Carolina. I'm fairly certain Bell South is AT&T now. Like 15 different splits, but he worked there for comments to let us know. Yeah, he, he worked there for ages and he always made it clear that you should be very fair, stern, but fair, you know, and that really taught me just how to um, treat everyone with respect. And I think that's why a lot of the people who I mentored, um, when I left my big agency job to move to LA, girls teared up at my goodbye party and they were like, you're the only one who's never made us cry in a bad way. And like, I was like, well, thank you. That's so nice. Um, And he taught me, you know, never to burn bridges and to always keep those connections. Um, I mean, when I first started freelancing, one of my old interns hired me for a project. So you just never know where things are going to come from. But so he um, was a wonderful business influence. So was my dad. Um, He's in real estate, commercial real estate. And, you know, he worked off of straight commission when I was a kid. He went from selling Calvin Klein and that whole business model changed. You know, you used to go to the apparel mart and it still kind of happens, but things really shifted and he didn't want to be an on the road salesman. Um, so just taking that risk, my parents have always been very supportive of me, you know, moving to New York after two weeks after college graduation, I'm from Georgia yeah, and then nice. being there and jumping to LA. Once I make up my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And I think that's just from having, you know, a supportive family. Um, One of my mentors, I would say is a former boss of mine. She runs a very, very successful agency um, in New York City. And she, it's funny, we're very different. Uh, She looks like a Barbie doll. 
Uh, she didn't wear pants for probably 15 years, only dresses. I've since seen since I left that she does occasionally wear like shiny leggings. Um, always, you know, lipstick on, heels on. And she, I think probably at first had an issue with me. I'm a little bit more hippy dippy. I'm very tall. So I'll wear like the flats or the flowing dress. Um, and I probably wasn't the right style necessarily, but she trusted me in my work and it made me feel really empowered. The fact that I kept moving up the ladder there when I didn't necessarily fit the mold. Yeah. Yeah. So you really did have the Devil Wars Prada story going on. Well, she wasn't the one, she was not the one that threw a water bottle or an umbrella at me. That <laughs> She was not the one. Um, she was wonderful. I mean, she's still just killing it right now. Um, but yeah, I was definitely learning also things I didn't want. Um, and I think that seeing other bosses show me what I don't want to be. So it was nice seeing both sides of the coin, you know, how I wanted to become a boss or just become a, you know, industry person. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I know I had a similar situation at the, uh, the company where I was the, the director of uh, marketing um, was the, the president of the company sort of took me under his wing um, and taught me a whole bunch about mm -hmm. running a company and how they, uh, um, how he thinks about that kind of stuff. And, you know, things like, like, you know, for them, payroll is like the number one thing in their, in their life. Right. It's so, it, cause they got a hundred employees and they're like, you know, everyone tells you the customers first. And they're like, it's not it's your employees, your employees come first. Um, and your customers come second. Um, and I was like, I, you know, I, I never heard that before until you actually, you know, get into someone who's running a big company and you realize like, that's true. You know, when yeah. you hire, hire if your people. employees aren't happy, if you have a lot of turnover, I mean, props to this, this boss that I was talking about, she, pays her people well, gives, especially compared to, you know, New York PR jobs, especially if you want to work in like beauty or fashion, it really doesn't pay well. Um, and so there's a lot of perks, but she would pay well and she would make you feel valued. And um, I think she has people there for a very long time because of that. Whereas a lot of these other agencies are very churn and burn. They pull everything out of you and then, all right, on to the next. Yeah, once you've been sucked dry. Do you, mm -hmm. you remember the old mummy movies with Brendan Fraser? Yes. <laughs> yeah, the guy like he sucks yeah. and then the corpse falls. Like that's how they. That's how the industry works. Yeah, oh, I, I feel that. I feel like actually connected to that imagery. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, I want to bring it home for our listeners a little bit and talk about your guiding principles. Top one or two principles or actions that you put into practice, sort of every day, that you think contribute to the success and influence that your company enjoys now? Maybe ones that you wish you had known when you started out, out on your own. I would say structure. Um, I'm, I'm loose within my structure, but I also, I wake up. I mean, luckily I guess the diabetic dog helps, you know, we yeah. wake up, I have to do a shot. I have to take care of him. I have started incorporating now uh, morning meditation and that's just been semi recently, but I do think it's helped me focus. Um, and center. And so then I, I sit down by 8 a.m. and I get going. I answer my emails first. I also have started putting all of my calls on one or two days. So instead of having like two calls here or two calls there, I just bang them out. I'm exhausted. I actually rescheduled this podcast once because I realized I scheduled it for a day where I had four other calls. I was like, my, I'm going to be dead. Like, I'm not going to be able to contribute anything. So I'm doing it that way because then I can execute because it was really a struggle for me at the beginning. There's only certain hours that you can pitch editors and I'm on the West coast and a lot of editorial is in New York. So I really have to map right. that around you know, and make sure I'm, I'm hitting it at the right time. Um, so structure has been helpful. I mean, I'm a little like OCD anal about certain things anyways. So that's always been kind of easy for me, but I know a lot of entrepreneurs or even friends in my position a, a girlfriend was over here the other day and she's like, oh, wow, you, you start at eight. She's like, I have a hard time starting by 10, but then she's also stays up really late and writes all of her pitches and preps. So yeah. she has her way of doing things and I have mine. So it's finding what's good for you. Yeah. And then going back to just kindness. I mean, I know we've, we've talked about that a lot today, but just being kind to people and just trying your best to help others out. Don't get taken advantage of as we were, talking about, but um, seeing what you can do for other people, because it is going to come back for you. 
Yeah, yeah. I always, I always say the uh, the the rule of the universe is give first and then you'll receive. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's it wasn't uh, um, necessarily like a law. This is what you should do. It was more like, hey, this is the way the world works. And uh, you know, it's when you sort of understand that about kindness and understand that, hey, if I just uh, like my business has grown mostly because I'm like, how can I find ways to give here without expectation of return and realize that like that's what actually creates return. Yeah. Uh, is I agree. No, it's a it's a good thing. Um, I mean, look, sometimes I wish that the karma would come back faster or stronger. I'm like, I did all of that for that person, but I do believe yeah. that people are there for you when you need them and, and vice versa. So I try to be a strong friend and mentor. What's really interesting is sometimes like you like you try to, you can't always connect the dots for like where you would give something and then you get something back. Um, but you realize it's like, Hey, I've, you know, I helped this person and they were like, they remembered that and they tell someone else and they tell someone else. And like, you end up with like, I've got people that are like top in their industry in places that are like, Hey, I've heard about you. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and that happens because of like that exact thing because of that. The small uh, things. Yeah. I mean, I, all of my business has come from referrals from former clients, from, um, editors just from people in the industry that I've worked with, maybe they're doing sales and I've done PR on a brand and I did a good job. So they want me on their other brands. Yeah. And um, that's been amazing for me. I've, I've gone after one or two brands I just thought were really cool. And that never goes anywhere. I've decided it's just not even worth it for me to try to pitch. Cause I do feel like the, the things that come to me are meant for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So just quick comment on the structure thing. Mm -hmm. uh, funny story if you ever get into the traveling bit one of the things that I struggle with with structure is like three weeks ago I was on pacific time and then two weeks ago I was on mountain time and now I'm on central time and then like a couple of weeks we'll be on eastern time oh yeah that's gonna be hard all of your calendar stuff that you set up like shifts mm -hmm. so like I'm used to like I had uh, a couple weeks ago my, my regular client meetings all started at nine and now they all start at 11. <laughs> and it's very different. It's very different to start at nine than to start at 11. Um, I'm actually, I'm gonna be in New York. I go regularly with clients who are launching things to meet with editors. They're called desk sides. You literally go to the side of the desk of the editor and sort of hawk your wares, if you will. Um, but I'm gonna be there on a Tuesday, which is when I have all my calls and I'm, I'm realizing, yeah, that's gonna be all around lunchtime. So I'm trying to like shift my brain. That would be hard. How are you doing it? Um, so we travel slowly most of the time, okay. <laughs> which makes the transitions easier. But like we were, we came all the way across to help someone move. Um, and then we're visiting some family and like we're, our goal was to end up on the East coast. So it's like a month of struggle mm -hmm. and it'll just be firmly into the Eastern time zone um, for a while. Cause we're going to do the whole East coast from Florida to New York this year. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it should be cool. My uh, my wife's bucket list is to go see the Macy's Day Parade. So we're going to try and make it to New York by the Macy's Day Oh, I love that. That's so funny because when, when you live in New York, you like avoid that because it's just so, you like can't get anywhere. But I love that kind of stuff now. Even um, out in LA, the LA Marathon always runs right past my house. I've lived yeah, in the same street. Yeah, Rose Parade goes by around there too, doesn't it? Yeah, so I actually went. So they're in Pasadena. I went for the first time this year because typically that's not something... I would, you know, wake up at 6 a.m. on New Year's Day to go and do, but a um, calling a mentor of mine lives right off the route, so she invited me, and it was so cool. It was a very interesting experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I, have a, I have a client in New York who was like, hey, my office overlooks the route. Like, when you come, you can come sit, visit, and I was like, that's sweet. That's perfect. No, that's what you need. You need a, an inn. Um, you know, like New York Times Square for New Year's Eve is it's crazy, but I remember one year... Um, a friend of mine had a friend who had an apartment right there. So we avoided the craziness, but then at like 12.02, we ran down, you know, to see it. It was worth it. But I, there's no way I'm standing out in the cold for eight hours, though, for that. <laughs> That's actually the thing I'm most frightened about going to New York in November is like, we're going to go and it's going to be New York and it's going to be November. And I'm a California kid, right? I grew up in Temecula. So like, to me, 65 degrees is cold. I would say, yeah, but I grew up in Georgia and... It was, you know, it was okay. Then when I moved to New York, I got used to it. You know, you wear basically a sleeping bag all day. You wear a huge puffer coat and your boots. But now I've been out in LA for six years. Somehow I always end up back in New York in January or February. Every year. 
I'm like, this is a cruel joke. I purposely laugh to get away from this, but your blood thins or something happens because it's painful. Uh, California, California ruins you for cold weather. I had to like go and buy a long sleeve shirt because I didn't own any. We're out here in the in the Midwest, and I was like, I I need long sleeve shirts. Oh yeah, you're gonna have to start layering. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like, I got uh, what do you call them? Long johns and long sleeve shirts and like little gloves and a hat that goes over. I'm like, oh, things I don't need when you're on the West Coast. There are a lot of people. It's funny just the difference between New York and LA. People are starting to come together. It used to be very much like, oh people in LA, even when I was in New York, you know, you're like, how are these publicists doing anything out there? It's just a different world. But yeah. now people are starting to move to LA from New York. They're starting to be a lot more open-minded, especially in my industry, because things have shifted so much and yeah. there's a boom out here. Um, but the people who are from LA, I don't know how you go anywhere else. I really don't. It's so great here. It is. It's really nice. I don't, I don't particularly like LA itself. Yeah. I like the South. San Diego's my gem. Oh, San Diego's amazing. I was just there uh, right before Christmas. That's so nice. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like LA except clean and pretty. I actually thought if I am ready to not be in the scene as much, that's somewhere where I'd love to go. And I have a girlfriend I used to work with in New York who lives there now, and she's freelancing too. She does what I do, and she is capable, but she has to drive up to LA a lot for meetings. Here's what you do. You wait until you can afford a helicopter. Yeah, well... I don't, know. I don't know anymore. Yeah. yeah, I guess not with the uh, the recent uh, news stories. But I, I had uh, in high school. I went to high school in a uh, in Temecula, which is like halfway between San Diego and LA. Mm -hmm. And we had a subset of our students that were the rich kids, you know, rich, the rich parents' kids. Yeah. And uh, you know, they would drive the Lamborghini into school or whatever their dad's Lambo. Um, and like, you know, their dad took the helicopter into work and in LA kind of thing. And I was like, that's totally a thing that happens. Well, yeah, the commute here is awful. I mean, now they, they do have planes that do that. There's planes just from Orange County, like these little five seaters that hop up. But again, back to why it's good to be an entrepreneur and sit yeah. at home and do your work. Go into the, uh, don't have to go into the office if you don't want to. Exactly. It's really cool. So um, that you know, at this point, it basically wraps up the interview. I have one last thing I do with all of my, uh, all of my guests called the hero show or the hero challenge and the hero challenge is pretty simple. Um, it's basically this, do you have someone in your life or in your network that you think has a cool entrepreneurial story? Mm -hmm. Who are they? First names are fine. And why do you think they should come share their story on our show? Oh God, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is people who already do what I do. So I don't know if that's, that's right. that attractive. Um, I would say that my sister is in New York. She used to work in TV at The Chew um, when that was a show for years. Then she was the right-hand woman to a very well-known chef who has unfortunately um, gone under from some of the recent uh, news media situations. And she completely revamped herself. She is now a yoga and meditation instructor um, she also works with celebrity chefs, so she made a way of connecting those two worlds. But I was just talking to her this morning, and she, you know, really could have totally fallen on her ass. I mean, her whole the whole team fell apart, and it was a really hard time. And she just immediately picked up and kept going, and is now I think making what she was making at that job by being a yoga teacher in a very competitive landscape. That's really cool. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll reach out afterwards and see if we can uh, um, get our contact deals, details and invite her onto the show. So um, at this point, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show and find out from you, where can people find you if they are interested, if they've got a physical product brand and they, they're looking for someone to... Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so before, before we answer that, who are the ideal people to reach out, right? So if someone's listening and saying, you know what, I, this, this, you know, at least it's for me. Those so the ideal people would be someone who has a physical beauty, grooming, wellness in the health space. So let's say you are making a skincare line, men's grooming, um, even, I, I don't necessarily do fashion, but let's say you have like a yoga clothing line or something, I could pull in the right people for that. Um, and it would be, I've worked with some people from the very, very beginning. One thing I love doing is the consulting aspect. So if you're trying to come up with your packaging, your copy, um, I'm not just a, hey, here's my product, go pitch it. That's actually you know what you do when you're at an agency. And so what I've loved about having my own is I can really get in from the ground with these brands and feel like I'm part of them. Um, and then you can find me on 
elisekoenig.com. It's E-L-Y-S-E-K-O-E-N-I-G.com. Um, and if I'm not the right person for you, but you're looking for some advice, I'm happy to, you know, find the right publicist. If you have a, a baby brand or, you know, I've got girls that work just in the mommy sphere. So it really is a well-connected kind of machine out here. That's really cool. Yeah. So if you are in that space, you listen to this and you have a, you know, physical product brand, you need to get into that stage where you're doing PR. Um, definitely take the chance to reach out to, to Elise and, you know, pick her brain a little bit. Sounds like she's very connected in the industry, even if you're not in the beauty space. Um, and again, it's, uh, E L Y S E K O E N I G.com. Um, and Elise, thank you so much for coming on the show. Do you have any sort of final parting words of wisdom for our guests before we hit the, uh, the stop record button here? I would say just go for it. I think that that's, you know, I'm sure what a lot of other people say, but it's, if you have that chance, take it. I think I could have talked to that microbe later about, oh yeah, I'm not sure what I want anymore. Thanks for doing my eyebrows and then gone and gotten another job that wasn't as satisfying, but I took the opportunity and shared what I was doing. And then that's when the rest of the business came in. So if you see it, take it or make it happen for yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. This is fun. Great talking to you.